Thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Anya Aleman. I'm the Innovation Director at Ascender. Um, today's session is part of our monthly educational programming that we have here um, in our virtual space at Ascender. If this is your first time joining us, welcome, and we're really excited to have you. If this is one of many times that you have joined us in all of our community events, welcome back. It's nice to see you again. Um, for those of you that may not know a little bit about Ascender, I just wanted to quickly tell you about our, our organization. Um, Ascender is Pittsburgh's community for entrepreneurs. We offer educational programs, mentorship, expert coaching, business incubation, and a collaborative workspace located in East Liberty here in Pittsburgh. In addition to um, the programs that we provide, uh, we provide monthly educational series um, programs just like this one that are free uh, for everybody and, and which uh, the main mission here is and the main goal is that we provide you with um, um, access to experts to, uh, for you to provide, uh, to gain new tools, skills, and also connect to one another. So um, this is the right space for you to be in if you are starting on thinking of starting of building a uh, company and also just like gaining new skills and new connections, um, you know, for you and for your business moving forward. Uh, if you are interested about Ascender and all of the other programs that we offer, please feel free to visit our website and uh, you can find more information about the different types of programs that we provide and also connect with us. We will also be sharing our contact information in the chat box for you to have. Um, as, I said, as I mentioned before, today's session is part of our educational uh, monthly series. Um, and uh, this is part of a new program that we launched this year called Real Talk. And the main, the main thing about here is just, we want to have an honest conversation with the experts that we bring in. Today's conversation is going to be guided and leaded by our executive director, Nadine Nunez. And our, our guest today, we are very excited to have him joining us is Will Allen. He, he co-founded the Nason Group Holdings, overseeing investment in tech and real estate sectors. Will has been an active investor, investor for the past seven years. Previously, he played uh, for 12 years in, in, um, in the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Buccaneers. Uh, he also founded the Will Allen Foundation, which provides tools and resources to educate, influence, and empower people um, in their surrounding neighborhoods and community. Uh, so he's one, an active member, both uh, in the investing world and also in the community. So we're really happy to have him here today. Um, you know, for an hour long event where we can learn more about um, Will. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Nadili uh, Nunez, our executive director, who will get started with the discussion today. All right, welcome everyone. We have, I have in front of me a list of 40 questions, a combination of mine and some of the ones that you came, you know, submitted and we try to organize it. We'll try to get through as many as possible, but uh, Will, thanks again for coming. And is there anything that maybe we didn't cover about a little bit your background or that you wanna say what, you, what you're doing or what you've done? Um, well, maybe, maybe a little bit, but I think, you know, one thing that I'm really, really focused on now is how do we build a more economic inclusive, you know, middle class that's diverse. And I think uh, what's happening now in this election, some of the um, racial unrest that, we, that we've been witnessing for a, a number of years. And um, I don't know if anyone knows these statistics, but, you know, African-Americans and minorities in Pittsburgh on average make about $26,000, you know, in income, you know, in Allegheny County, they make about 31,000. Um, those are staggering, saddening um, statistics. And uh, I just think that for me, you know, a part of my personal credo in life's mission is how do we level that, how do we level that playing field? Um, that's a question I ask myself and, and try to seek solutions on. So, Working with multi-stakeholders uh, and, and people that have that same vision is something I'm really, really passionate about and trying to change that. I know it's a long-term goal and a long-term focus, but if we could, you know, double that, you know, where people, minorities and African-Americans in Pittsburgh are making 42,000, <laughs> you know, that, that, I mean, and that's still not a lot of money, but it's, it's better, you know, it's better. Um, 
you know, th that's my goal is how do we raise, you know, minimum wage? How do we find meaningful work? How do we build a more entrepreneurial ecosystem that's just not technology, but multi-sector, multi-industries? Um, and so I'm really, really excited to share some of my thoughts and ideas around that um, as it relates to investing, as it relates to philanthropy, um, and also workforce development and, and you know, economic inclusion. That's great. And, and we have a set of questions related about just that. But, but first, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with you or know you in one way and maybe not the other, particularly, can you talk a little bit about why you got into investing? I think the first time you invested was in maybe 2008. Yeah, you know, what really got me into investing was thinking of alternative ways to make income. Um, that was the first thing and how to build wealth. And I, I, I didn't have, again, this mission that I have now, but back then, 2008, I was much younger. Um, I was in the middle of my football career, um, playing professional sports, and uh, I was bombarded with a bunch of, you know, deals. And I quite frankly didn't know what to do. I didn't have anybody around me that I could trust. And you would think like, hey, here's somebody on a professional national stage um, who's considered a celebrity or whatever, what have you, or some influence, they should have a team of people around them. And the reality is a lot of people that play professional sports, they just don't, and they don't know who to trust. Um, so for me, it was about dipping my toe in the water and trying to understand what this world of investing is. Um, I'm going to be honest. I mean, I was 21. Um, I didn't have my money in the stock market. I didn't put my money into the stock market to take advantage of the, uh, the, the gains in the stock market until I was about 25 or 26. So, you know, I got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just in different bank accounts, not earning money for me. And that, that was a reality check that I had to have because I said, I don't know anything about the stock market. I'm not going to invest in it, but I didn't know what to do. I was never educated. So I started seeking out, you know, help, start seeking out support, start seeking out mentorship and coaching about what to do and where to go. Um, so um, my first investment was a real estate investment and a new development uh, with a group of people that I knew that were experts and had done it before um, and people that I have relationships with. So that investment turned out really good. So, uh, um, but I, you know, I, I got the bug and wanted to do more, wanted to explore more after that. Do you, you know, now that it's been some years investing, do you have a startup type, you know, one that you gravitate towards, whether it's stage or industry that you seem to gravitate towards investing? Yeah, you know, I'm agnostic to the, to the space or industry, right? I, I think I, uh, my mindset and my passion lies with the early, early stage, seed stage, you know, entrepreneur, um, the person who's got a great idea or, or the group that has a great idea um, and they're trying to navigate the first steps to company formation, um, raising capital um, and how, how to build a, a strong team, how to strategize around value proposition um, and how to get their product to launch um, and grow and scale. So I love that, that nascent um, early, early, early side of it, uh, primarily because there's a lot of alignment with sports. Um, I've been I, I, I've been an entrepreneur since I was eight years old, and I say that because, and playing NFL football is is a profession, whether you want to believe it or not. It's entertainment, but it definitely is a profession. Uh, I, you know, but I've been training since I was eight uh, for for that moment, and and, I, and building my way, fighting adversity, persevering, not getting cut, not getting kicked off a team, um, things of that nature that help you and mold you and and shape you. Uh, for entrepreneurs and learning how to iterate, learning how to, you know, uh, sharpen my sword for the battle, all these different aspects you need to learn of, around strategy as well, and how to take risk and when to take risk. So um, I, I, I liken those early stages of entrepreneurship to, you know, playing sports. Um, you got competition, you got to build a team, uh, you, you got to have a goal in mind, you got to have a vision, um, but you also have to know and have a keen and an awareness around what you really want to do, right? And how you're going to go about doing it um, and how you're going to lead and uh, what you're convicted on. And I think um, that's, I find, I find a great deal of alignment there. 
it sounds like you are being to these entrepreneurs who you wish you had when you were kind of being a, a entrepreneur, you know, since growing up and being an athlete, having someone around you to mentor you and to support you. Well, when I think when it comes to business, yes. Uh, when it comes to sports, I always had great coaches, you know? So I think that's one thing that helped me is understanding that um, you need a great coach, someone who's been there, someone who's tested, tried, and someone who can give you positive feedback, critical feedback, and tell you when, no, that's, that's not a great idea. You shouldn't do that. And, and, and you have to learn how to, how to receive that information um, and go back and recalibrate. And I've had coaches tell me I suck. I've had coaches tell me that you're not good enough. I had coaches tell me to my face, if I put you on the field, I may lose my job. I won't be able to feed my family. Like I've had this, I've had them say this to me. Now that, that doesn't happen in the corporate setting, um, but these are the people who's promoting me or has authority over my, over my growth, right? So I have to listen to them and I have to take that feedback and I have to be able to adjust and adapt and recalibrate and produce something that's valuable, not only for the masses, but for my team, for my coaches, my head coach, my defensive coordinator, the ownership, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. The ownership wrote me a check and they're expecting a return on that, you know? Right. And, that, and, that's, and, that, and that's how it works. And you need those honest voices to kind of call you out, you know, especially when you're kind of thinking in your own vacuum, you know, well, okay, hold on, no. But yeah. what you mentioned helping early stage and seed stage, and sometimes those are the folks that have the highest risk, right? There's so much, there's so many directions they can end up going. And you had talked before, or I've read that you talk about building trust. And I think that is true for different investors. Can you trust this company? Can you trust this founder? And how can a founder on that end of the table build trust with you? It is, I think, being transparent. <clears throat> you know, I can't help you if I don't know how to help. You know, I can't help you or support you if I don't know what risk we are, we're going up against together because we're a team, right? Mm -hmm. And whenever you have a team, you got to have trust. It's not, oh, I'm a team because I said I'm on a team. No, you're on a team because we're in this fight together. Um, we're not going to quit. Uh, we're not going to give up. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to exhaust all of our resources together. And I think that that has to be the bottom line. Um, and, and we're, we're committed to, to that, to that, to whatever that true North may be. Um, and, uh, and, lo and long as we know that we're both putting that type of sweat equity into the, into the operation, into the business, into the strategy, then I think, I think we definitely build trust. And I think that's the business side, but I think getting to know each other outside of business, I mean, it may, it may not be for everyone, but I think really, really, I really believe that that's important. Part of it is getting to know people, being transparent, being honest. If I have a problem, if I can't solve anything, Will, can you help me? Do you have someone in your network? Can, can we strategize around this? How should I be talking to my team? How should I be leading my team? Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, if I don't have the answer, I'll try to find someone who, who does. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing that I feel, feel builds trust is that transparency, uh, that willingness to, be, to, to show humility um, and, 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 and building together. So, so if a company comes to you and says, look, our financials, they're not looking right. Yeah, they're not, we're not doing well. Some, some founders are scared to do that because they don't want you to, they finally have the ear of, a, of an investor. They don't want to show you that they're maybe in the red or that they're struggling. And it, although you might actually be able to help them. So how can you help brace that or make a founder feel more comfortable doing that with you? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm unique in that way. I don't, I, I don't have been, a lot of VCs or a lot of investors. They may not like that, to be honest with you. They may like, why are you telling me this? That's a turnoff. A lot of angel investors may be like, why are you telling me this? That's a turnoff. And I would say, know who you're speaking to, know who the type of person, do your homework on what they look for, what they like, what, what type of verbiage to utilize with them, uh, because everybody is different. For me, I would, I would embrace that because now I know that, hey, you recognize, you, know the, you recognize the problem and you're seeking solutions from the right people. And I think a lot of people don't seek solutions. They, they try to figure out how they can do it on their own. And they, and which is fine, you know, you, you know, but it's always good to have good coaches around you to help you recognize certain things that you haven't experienced yet. Mm -hmm. of, of the companies that you've held, how did you end up meeting them? Did they cold call you? Did it, was it a networking event? Was it a friend of a friend? Uh, it's a little bit of everything, you know, some of it is deal flow. 
from um, individuals that I know. Some of it is cold, cold emails, uh, cold LinkedIn connections. Uh, some of them come through other investors. Uh, I think it's just a matter of, you know, how that deal flow is curated. And, you know, but I've, you know, or, or there could be, you know, places like Ascender or, or Alpha Lab or Alpha Lab Gear and, you know, you know, different accelerators. I think it just depends. Like once you're immersed in the ecosystem, you, you people are drawn to you or you are drawn to them. Right. And, you know, it, it kind of, you know, I guess very naturally just grows and happens. When, when you're an investor, especially in Pittsburgh, you might even have to, you know, hide where you live, right? Because you'll get a bunch of people knocking on your door and then you go, okay, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. So what's the best way or how would you prefer, prefer to learn about companies when everyone wants your money? Don't knock on my door. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that won't get you any money or any support. Uh, but I, I, I would applaud the effort, but I, I would be turned off about that. Uh, I just think it's a matter of speaking to other entrepreneurs that's been funded, um, whether they've been funded from Pittsburgh uh, investors or outside of Pittsburgh investors, outside of Pittsburgh investors, because they know they build relationships. And when you come highly recommended, you know, that that opens the door pretty, pretty quickly. You, if I if as an investor, I, I if, it, if it's a company or, or an entrepreneur I've invested in or I've, I have a great deal of respect for and they bring in an entrepreneur that they that they say, hey, you should work, you should work with, um, you know, X, Y, and Z company. You should really speak to them. I would say, okay, great. I love to talk with them, especially come, you're vouching for them and I trust you and respect you. So it's kind of word of mouth. And I would say the other part is who are the champions that, who are the champions in your, in your circle, in your life that, that you trust that can vouch for you? I think that's the biggest thing too. Um, and find that alignment, you know, really, uh, really strategize but not be just so thirsty for that connection. I think a lot of times people are overly, overly aggressive and I, and, and I get it. You know, you got, you got to be, you got to go, you got to go get it. But I do believe that the organic relationship um, lasts longer because it's not an exchange. It's not a transaction. Um, it's, it's a lot more sticky and, and personable. So I, I, I like the, I like those relationships. Um, even when I turn you down, keep me updated. You know, you never know. I may be able to bring another investor in. I say, Hey, I really like this group. I really like this founder. It just wasn't for me at the time. Take a look at it, you know, um, and then go from there. So that that's kind of how I see, you know, how I recognize entrepreneurs, um, you know, and, and, and that's how kind of, that's kind of how I like working with them. Great. What do you do if there's an entrepreneur business that has a product, but no sales? Should they even approach you? That's perfectly fine. I think you have to, as an investor in early stage, you have to understand what the landscape and how companies grow. And you have to understand how you want to invest and where you want to invest. Um, you know, a lot of companies um, don't have sales, but they have a tre tremendous idea. Um, but you have to evaluate yourself as an investor and say, well, can I help really add value to this company? Can I really truly add value to this company besides just my check? And if I can't, is a value proposition compelling enough to where I can just give them a check and just walk away? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't know that as an investor, you probably shouldn't be investing. And if it's a space that, and if it's a space that you're unfamiliar with and you need time to educate yourself or call people in your network that may have a, a domain expertise before you write a check or before you decide to give value to that entrepreneur, you should do so. You should do your homework. You should really you know, um, run your diligence and, 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 and really build from there. But for me, that, that's, that's really it. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't shy away from, from companies that don't have revenue. Um, I just think it's, it, it depends on the industry they're in. It depends on a lot of other factors as well. Can you elaborate? One of the questions was, do you have a criteria or specific things you're looking when you are evaluating or, and evaluating, I should say more when you're looking into a company? It, 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 it's, I have a broad range of criteria that I trust. Um, I think it all depends on the company. I think it all depends on the industry. 
So in the, in the entrepreneur, those are the three things. What about, can you give an example? You, and I don't mean you need to specify the name or anything, but of a company that approached you and you were just like, no, you know, what is, what is a no for you? Um, you know, it's hard to get a no up front. I'll at least hear it out. Um, and I'll at least have a 30 minute to 45 minute conversation with you. Like, I won't just say no, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I want to hear it out first. Um, what, what will be a no is if, you, you, you as an entrepreneur, you don't, you're in a, you're in a soup. If you're in a crowded market and you're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing or an iteration of, of what some like, don't like, that's not going to work. Um, I think you need to have, for me, I, that's a turnoff. Uh, it's a, and it's, it's a, an exact turnoff because there's nothing differentiated about your product. There's nothing differentiated about your thought process. So, you know, and that, that really bothers me, but I won't know that until I hear them and I look through a deck, um, you know, and that's it. Like I, I turned down a company. Um, I didn't turn them down. I just say, I'll watch. I never just say like, no, I'll just say, you know what? Now's not the right time. I'll, I'll, I love watching. Keep me updated because when you're in such an early stage, eventually what happens is, you, you, you should make iterations. You should do some type of hypothesis testing and see what the market is saying about your product. And if you need to change, what is the data telling you? Um, or will you keep going? Um, th that is a true measure of an entrepreneur. Um, so I won't just say no, because a year later, you may say, hey, Will, guess what? You know, we didn't do this, we didn't do that. Um, or I'll give you like three things I, I believe you should, you should try to you know, in, you know, embed into what you're doing. Um, so I just said, just, just keep, just keep going, you know, keep, keep fighting. Um, don't, don't give up because same thing. I, I, I take it back to my sports days. When that coach is telling me I wasn't good enough, when that coach is telling me you suck, when that coach is telling me I can't put you on the field because you're not ready, that didn't stop me. I had to go recalibrate. Right. And then that entrepreneurial moment I produced and that's what I, that's what I want to see. So if you came back to me and said, Hey, I took your feedback. I listen to what you said, man. I, thank you for that coaching. This is what this is what this is what me and my team is doing now. Do you think you can help me? Do you think we're fundable now? Oh, great. Possibly, you know. So I think I look for that. I look for that. Um, you know, I did I did tell a company no because I I didn't I didn't feel like, and I had multiple conversations with them, and um, I just said I just don't think you're ready, and I, I don't think you're the person to lead this company. You know, I said, I just, I just don't think you're the person to lead this company. Um, you know, I think you're an engineer and I think you need someone who knows the space a little deeper. I think you're a bright individual, but you're not the person I, I don't believe to lead this company. Um, they didn't like that and um, they didn't like my check size. So I, I walked and that was it. <laughs> that was it. That, that's right. You know, every, every person has their choice at that table. And, yeah. and that kind of connects to something you I've heard you say about part of what you want to do with the entrepreneurs to help them be better people. And when I think of that, it's not just a better founder or maybe as a result, maybe you're a better founder, but it's not just business. It's as the individual. Can you talk a little bit more about what being a better, how you want to help them be better people? Yeah, I think it's, I don't, that's not like, I'm not trying to change anybody, right? Like people change themselves. Let's, let's be very clear about that. Um, but I just like to give advice on how on different perspectives on how to see the world, um, you know, and, and, and I think that I've definitely made adjustments in my life through, like, again, mentorship, coaching, um, and people who are, I, you know, have been wildly successful. So you got to listen and absorb and then go create your own canvas. And I, and I just, you know, I just think there's things to glean and aspects of life to glean from different people who you respect and who you have trust with. Um, so that, that's, that's how I want to help entrepreneurs, whether, you know, if it's something, if they, if it's, if I'm not too being too invasive, if it's something they're dealing with their families, if it's something they want to be more involved in the community, if it's something that they, they're passionate and they care about that they want to kind of, you know, integrate into their business, you know, that's, that's what I'm here for. And I think you should be, your business and what you're passionate about, what you care about should be a reflection of you and how you, and how you navigate with your team should be a reflection of you and what you, what you personally care about. Um, and that, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of how I lead and that's how I lead, you know, with investing. 
how would how would you uh, you know it sounds to me that you are very in, uh, wanting to just be helpful you know it's beyond like you said it's beyond the check it's can I be helpful as a mentor can I connect you can you do all these things and there's some investors who do that some investors that don't and as you've been swimming in these conversations with other investors can you describe maybe some of the other personality types that you see and and the differences and and how can maybe a founder navigate those differences yeah I mean you you definitely have to know I think every founder should do a study on management style right? Understanding your management style, understanding other uh, investors' management style, understanding how to manage people, like, and, and then putting that, and then applying that to, to like, real life, and what, the way you do that, if you got uh, an investor that, you know, is a little bit more harsh and brash, you, you, you know, you have to adjust, and you have to adjust to who they are, or if you want to do business with them, or if you want to build a relationship with them. I think that's why it's, it's, it's critical to do your homework. It's critical to understand that type of person and their and their management style. Um, but I just I just really think that it's it's not one way or you know you just you just should be leery of the type of person you're dealing with. You should be very very aware of who they are, how they speak, what adjectives they use, and you should be aware of the adjectives you use to describe yourself and other people um, because it tells a lot about how you think about the world is, do you have a selfish mindset or do you have a selective mindset or do you have a collaborative mindset? Um, and those are things I, I definitely, definitely try to, to be aware of. Um, but, you know, you may have, again, some, some, some investors who are brash and just make my money return. You know, some people are in gray areas and then some people are just, you know, very passive and happy go lucky and just very nice people. And I don't think it's one is one is right or wrong. It just depends on who you want to deal with. What do you do? And, and I know there's some questions in the chat box and I'll bring them up soon. But what do you do when you're not, you know, you're a founder and you need money, right? You're you either got zero or you, it's coming close. But the investor that's offering potentially some funding is maybe one that you might be difficult to work with. You make anything happen because you're a, or you should be if you're a founder, you're resourceful. But how, what's your advice for founders in that position that they need the money? but the investor is going to be tough. Yeah. You know, we just got a, I just got a question from Camille Scantling who asked about equity and not giving up too much of their company and taking a bad deal. So I guess that's kind of the same in the same mm -hmm. vein. Um, wow. That's a really tough question. You know, <clears throat> you really need the money. Um, uh, so tough. Um, <laughs> you, you, if you really need the money and you don't want to take it from an investor, I, I think you should really, really try and be as patient as you can and bootstrap um, until, until you can get sales. That I think, and I, I think anybody would tell you that, any investor would tell you that, any mentor or coach would tell you that because that is entrepreneurship in its essence. Entrepreneurship isn't just taking VC money or angel money for equity of your company. Entrepreneurship is bootstrapping, is finding finding a way uh, to navigate. Um, I think the, the door will open and and uh, at the right time because it, it's, it's just not about grinding it out as much as it is having faith and, and believing in yourself and believing in your team. And you may have to have that tough conversation. This month, I can't pay y'all. Pay this month, I can't make it happen. You know, can you, can, can, will you guys stick with me? You know, we've made it this far. This is the, this is the next two, two best things we can do uh, to help our company. Um, and and we'll, we'll get there. And I love that about founders who find that resiliency. You know, I love them telling me that story and the, of, of those inflection points. So it's not always about taking money um, because it could be bad money. It could be you're, you're giving up too much of your company. Or, you know, and it, and it may not be right, you know, and, and I would say this, if you are going to give up a lot of your company, it better be worth it. If you're going to give up 20 to 30 percent in the early stage, you better be getting the two to five million dollar check, you know, so you can have, you know, 24, 36, you know, months of runway and you can move your family and take care of your team, you know, and then go double and triple that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the mindset you got to have. If I'm going to give up 20, 30 percent, the check better be well worth it. That's, that's very true. There's some people who their company just 
does really, really well, but in reality, none of it is, or a lot of it isn't theirs anymore from the founders because they've given so much of it away. So that, I appreciate you kind of giving kind of a number there. What, what would be a, a good range? You know, 2030 is a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a deal at that much, at that, at that, at that range. I mean, but some people have to, some people feel like they want it mm -hmm. and they, and I think it's a good, good relationship. If it's a good relationship there and you know that, that, that investor can add, add more value than just, you know, than taking value, then I would say do business. Uh, but personally, I, I, I don't know if I would take that deal, you know, unless it was like, you know, I'm working with Sequoia and they, they're, you know, I know what they can deliver and what they can bring or Sequoia like investor. And I know that, I know they're going to have follow on money. You know, if I do well, I know they're going to, they're, they're going to leave my series A. I know they're going to leave my series B and it's going to be, you know, they're going to help me grow this valuation to where I need, need and there's support systems to do that. Then maybe I'll, I'll think about it. Right. But I will limit the exposure and, and, and proceeding rounds to other investors, you know, because I know that 20 to 30% of my company is already, already taken away. Uh, and I, I need shares for my employees, which is big. So those are, those are all things and strategies you, sh you should be thinking about. If it's, if it's some angel investor coming in saying, oh, here's 500,000 or here's 250,000 and you're at the very infancy of your company, please find some grant money. Please find like uh, you know a, a low interest or no interest loan to help you help you seed your company or bootstrap it the best way you can. Try to get as many resourceful or or it, you know I, I don't care if it's a tech company or not. Like sometimes it's just it's just not worth it at that point. You know or try to negotiate down right. Say okay great I know where you are but really this is why I may only need fifty thousand and it's fifty thousand to get me here and I can show you that path that pathway and that milestone of what it, what it what it will deliver for us. Yeah, it's surprising to me how many entrepreneurs for whatever reason don't want to take out a loan but want to give out large percentages of their company. Uh, and, and sometimes when you're at that level you think, well I don't have any money to give. The only thing I can give you is maybe some equity in my business. What are some alternative uh, what have you advised companies you've worked with to, to offer alternatively to someone who's maybe giving them time, giving them a deal, maybe a manufacturer, whatever it might be? It, 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 it all depends on the situation. And quite honestly, I haven't ran into a lot of those situations. Um, I've, I've brought alternative funding to the table when, when necessary after I invested. Uh, but I, you know, there's, there's a bunch of resources here in town um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a bunch of creative, creative, uh, financing available that, that exists, you know, all over the country. I think you get, just got to do your homework. You know, you got to dig into it. You got to say, well, if this is not my, if this is not my path of receiving this type of funding, I need to go find other usage and, and, and figure out, you know, what that, what that cost of capital really means to my business, you mm -hmm. know, and you can go from there. I, I want to switch the conversation a little bit about how can we elevate underrepresented groups uh, in general. And I appreciate, you know, your point in that it's not just entrepreneurs, they need to be everywhere, right? It should be VCs, it should be the talent pool, it should be, you know, foundations. People of diverse backgrounds should be everywhere. It can't just be in one side. And so how, how, it's a loaded question, but maybe what are a couple of things, whether you're working on or you think that we need to be working on in the next five years to help elevate that maybe here in Pittsburgh? Tough question. Um, but I, I, my, what, I'm, what I'm focused on as an investor is I, I want the, you know, cause I, I'm heavy, heavy like tech, right? Heavy tech investing. You know, I want to, I want to see more black investors. I want to see, I mean, black entrepreneurs. I want to see more women entrepreneurs. I want to see more people of color um, entrepreneurs here in Pittsburgh. Um, I, I really strongly believe that it's needed. Uh, I really, I, and I want to, I want to invest in them. I really do. And I'm not excluding any other entrepreneurs. I'm just saying that's what we need in the next five years to, to create, um, you know, different avenues of wealth and wealth creation and entrepreneurship. Um, and I just firmly believe in that. 
and and I'm working hard to do it. I'm working hard to try to bring other entrepreneurs here, you know? So let's say I make an investment of someone in another city, let's call it Buffalo. Like I want, I would want you to move here. You know, think about all the engineering talent, you know, all the, all the assets that we have um, around town. Um, you know, you think about again, what Camille is doing um, and, 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 and a bunch of other people that will welcome uh, this, this entrepreneur talent and help them and support them, I think is amazing, you know, and, and that's kind of what Pittsburgh has, you know, great quality of life. Um, we're just missing, again, that diversity, you know, and, 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 and that, that's what sucks. So I would like to see that in the next five years, five to 10 years. I think it's a 10 year play, honestly, but you know, that's what I would like to see. How can, uh, and this might be a and I know this is real talk and you also get to decide whether you don't want to answer a question and move on. But, but some of this is sometimes the chicken or the egg here where we can elevate, it is my opinion that, uh, not representing a sender's opinion, just to kind of say that out there, uh, but we can elevate as many you know, uh, entrepreneurs of color, but if those who are the decision makers, who fund, who uh, provide you know, support, are not people of color as well, then, then we're, are we hitting a wall in a certain way? Now, in part, you have to grow entrepreneurs in order to be in that, those positions, right? And so what's the like order of operations if there is one? You know, it's, you know, because of the way that we just spoke about like 26, the average wage for African-American minority in Pittsburgh is $26,000. There's not gonna be a lot of people of color or African-Americans writing checks because the wealth isn't there. But that doesn't mean that, that there isn't a lot of educated African-Americans or people of color here. So education is the tool and the resource to unlock, you know, um, unlock that, unlock that, this access. And I, and I think that there is an inherent problem because of it, we don't have a lot of people of color that are investors. Um, and therefore the wealth doesn't, doesn't, isn't, isn't shared that way. Um, and there's a lot of bias because of it. You know, um, especially here in this city. And to, to be quite honest, um, if you don't look a certain way, or if you didn't come from a certain family, or if you didn't have a certain, you know, education, then they're not going to invest in you. And that's wrong. That's quite out wrong. That's confirmation bias, and you shouldn't think and believe that way. But those are the people with the checks, and they get the they get the power to write their checks how they want to. So I definitely understand that. I don't lead that way um, because I know there's a diverse talent pool of people outside of Pittsburgh and in Pittsburgh um, that are extremely talented and have a, you know great minds and um, they just need opportunities. So there needs to be systems um, and, and, and new systems that, that allow people to, to make investments on at, in different levels for different purposes and different reasons um, that aren't necessarily you know, wealthy white men that made their money um, and oil and gas and manufacturing, you know, to be quite honest. And, you know, so I think that's going to happen eventually. It just, it just takes time because the wealth isn't there. It's just not, you know, that's just, that's why I say in the next 10 years, that's what I would like to see, because that's what happens in Silicon Valley. That's what happens in Austin. You know, a lot of folks who, and I'm just giving the premise of it, who have exited their businesses, um, or if they're a, a mom and pop company and they've grown that company well and they sold it, um, they create ecosystems and the, the money just continues to flow within that ecosystem. And I think that's what needs to happen more here. It doesn't need to be insulated and siloed. And, uh, and it needs to, you know, you need to, you know, just lower that veil and that bias that you may have um, just because a person doesn't look like you or come from the same place as you um, or don't necessarily have those credentials. Yeah, I, I think maybe where I was coming from is you know, women investment, women exist in all kinds of spectrums, whether they came from a lower income household, a higher income household, uh, education, no education, there's still a lot of 2% investment. And so that's why I'm wondering, is the problem partly, which we know it is, but on the other side, are they hitting a wall because we're not seeing that representation more on the other side of the table? You know, if there's if there's bias, yes. If there's not bias, then no. I, I just think it depends on what city you're in and understanding 
how that marketplace invests and in, in being quite honest. Um, I think, I do, I do believe that it is changing here in this region, um, it, you know, from just people not having a bias, not, not necessarily the decision makers being people of color. So you, you just don't see it, you know, uh, it, we need more of that to have diversity of thought, diversity of interest um, and diversity of wealth uh, where people can, you know, it resonates, you know, um, I, I heard, I heard a while ago, I can't remember what thing maybe on PBS that they were doing this study on, you know, just young black girls and how they see the world. And meaning like if they don't see uh, black teachers or if they don't have uh, black art around them, or if they don't understand uh, that they don't see or understand that there, there's a pathway to a certain profession because nobody looks like them or comes from the place they come from, it, they don't feel inspired to go, to go do it. They don't feel inspired that they will do it. And- um, They think they don't belong there because they, they don't see they people. Belong. And I, 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 that, 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 that bothers me. And, um, and it makes me very passionate about trying to, again, balance that, balance that playing field. So going to search, going to places where people won't go, listening and having conversations um, that are necessary. And I'll tell you straight up, if, if, you're, if you're not fundable at this moment, these are the things you need to do. Like, and don't be mad at me, just listen. Like, I'm, and maybe I'm not right, go listen, go hear from five other people, right? And if you're so convicted on what you're doing and, I don't, and I'm not funding you or somebody else is not funding you, then go bootstrap it and improve it and come back, you know? Um, and then I'll say, oh, wow, you really, you really did that. You know, that's, that's phenomenal. You know, I love to be involved in what you're doing. Now, now I would thank you for answering that. And I think about, um, especially in underrepresented communities, the, the business that they're building is not necessarily for an exit. They're people who build the business because they want to sell it. But what if, what if you want to build a business to keep within your family and maybe pass it down to your generations? Do you, and this is coming from Camille that she reframed the question as I've been trying to multitask. So thank you, Camille, friend of Ascender here. And uh, how, someone in that situation, should they even take VC money? No, they shouldn't. And this is how it works, right? So how, VCs get money from institutions. Institutions get money from pension funds, retirement plans, um, 401k, excuse me, 401ks, uh, you name it, uh, foundations, you know, they have a responsibility to return, get a, get a return on that, on that, um, on that capital, right? So if I'm going to manager at a VC and I'm investing on behalf of these LPs, limited partners who are trusting me to get a return on that capital. Now they may tie in ESG goals. They may tie in diversity and inclusion goals. They may tie in other aspects that they believe in, but some of them don't. So if I'm a VC and my job is depending on return on capital, you know, um, based on these LPs, I that that is something I'm very keen of and aware of every single day. And I can't change that because this is the profession that I that I want to be in. So I I am seeking an exit. 100%, I'm seeking some liquidation event. That's not saying in between that liquidation event um, that we don't do good. We don't change the culture. We don't help people, you know, if necessary. Or if I'm mandated by my LP because they gave me $25 million to do so, then then yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's how the cycle works. Now, I will say, if that's if you as an entrepreneur you know that game you understand that game then don't go don't get VC money, you know um, unless you know like hey you know what I only need a little bit of VC money because I I just I, I love I love what that person is doing I love who they are and yes I'll give equity to them because I trust them but I'm not gonna do it anymore you know what and maybe when we're down the line and my revenues are you know 10 20 million I'm gonna cash them out you know and that's because they need a they need an exit event right. And I want to hold on to my company for longevity to pass down to my family. And I would say, if you don't want to go to VC, um, then it's all about bootstrapping. Um, it's all about holding as much equity as possible as you can, teaching your family, teaching the, your community members on the business that you're building and trying to help them build it as well and help them build companies as well. Um, and then you, then you both can fund each other. I think one thing that's missing, especially with companies who want to hold on is, 
hold on to equity and pass down their businesses is they don't understand succession planning, right? Mm -hmm. They don't understand what that means, how to build success, success, succession planning, uh, and also how to build frameworks for a hundred year business. I would, I would, I would say, find a, find a lawyer who can help you do it. Find an attorney who can help you do it. Read about it. Understand that's, that's building. That's almost building like a family office for yourself and for your family, because you, you want to pass it down. Um, I, and it's not just a, a you know, a, a black thing or African American thing or a person of color. It's you no, know, there's white, you know, groups and white companies that deal with this all the time. I'm, you know, and a family may own 60, 70% of the business and they don't have a succession plan in place, right? Or the grandchild or the father doesn't know what to do. And that that is very necessary. Um, and I would say, go, you know, when you're building a business like that, you know, you got to know your customer very well. You got to know how to sell because that's a big, big part of it. If you're not taking money, it's about bringing in as much revenue as possible. And, and thinking long term. Um, and then from there, you go get a loan, you go get lines of credit, you know, you take on that, because that's how our system works. And if you say, hey, I don't want to take on loan, I don't want to take on debt. Well, what, what are you going to leverage? You know, you, you got to leverage something, you got some assets, that's how our system works. So I think that's the best way to think about it is I, if I want to build this from the ground up, or if I want to go acquire a business, I got to have a succession plan, right? Um, with that, I have to have that established and I have to learn how my financing, like what is it going to take to finance this business for the next two years? What is it going to take to finance this business once I get to this point? And how do banks look at financing? They look at inventory, they look at assets, and they look at, you know, they look at your, uh, your, your, your net operating income. Those are the, like, because the, they want to know how to leverage the business. If your business goes out, goes out, goes out and it fails, what can we receive in collateral? Mm -hmm. and you have to understand that right? You have to understand that. So there's, there's risk to all of it. Now, now I, well, I know we're hitting up the hour soon. So I just want to get a couple of questions in and, and you talked about system. And we know that sometimes we talked earlier, you got to play the game sometimes, but sometimes systems need disruption in order to make some progress. And in, in your experience this far, is there anything in the entrepreneur or investor system or ecosystem that you think needs could benefit from some disruption? Well, I think every day people are looking to create new systems or um, expose uh, existing systems. So if you're not nimble enough, whether you're an investor or entrepreneur to always be understanding what the market is doing, but also be disciplined enough to, to focus on what your goals are, then you're missing out. You know, if, you, if you're sleepy, um, you're going to get crushed and you're going to get passed by. And that's just the truth. Um, I think you just have to have so much awareness, um, but also be disciplined enough. I, I like, I've, I've heard a entrepreneur and investor say, I want to, I want to build, uh, you know, um, I want to build a, a, a tank, right? I want to be durable like a tank, but I want to be, I want to build, you know, a rocket ship at the same time. Like, you know, I want to be durable like a tank so I can meet my milestones. Um, and those are important, but I also want to be, have the opportunity, you know, for a rocket ship. And I, and I just think, you know, that, that's got to be the mindset, you know, are we hitting those milestones? You know, are we being durable enough? Are we being nimble enough uh, to, 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 to build what we want? And, and to kind of wrap it up here, uh, you talked about you got to be awake of what the market is doing and, and what the trends are. Is there anything you're reading recently or have learned recently about the trends of upcoming trends or what 2021 might look like for an entrepreneur or an investor? Oh, wow. There, I mean, there's been so many because of COVID. You know, COVID it has exposed so much. And I'm thankful for that um, because it's presented so many opportunities for everyone. And, you know, you can, you can build, you can build a, a million dollar business from five to $10,000. If you know, if you get some coaching and know how to do it, like I'm being serious. Um, I, I, I don't like to pre have predictions and I don't like to have a crystal ball. Uh, but I would say if I'm looking at trends and this is just like high level and, and probably anyone would tell you this, I would, I would go to places 
that people are afraid to go. And I would go to, I would look at trends and data where um, there's been so much exploitation um, because of external factors that you find room to create a new business or to enhance the, the entire industry. I think some, again, people get lazy and they say, oh, I got an idea. And somebody's either done it or somebody can build it that has a greater market share and power. So I, I just think if somebody's already done it and somebody can build it, then it's not good enough. You know, go back and then really look at, look where people aren't going. I give, I, I, I got to think of it. Let me give an example of a company um, I recently invested in. There's a African American uh, founder out of Dallas, Texas. I just invested in his business. Now I argue with him, argue like we were in heated arguments about why his value proposition is what it is. And I said, no, Square can do this. Stripe can do this. Visa can do this. Like these companies can build what you're doing. Like why, what makes yours so great? Like, I don't see it. I don't get it. And, um, and he, you know, he showed, he just showed me the value proposition from a different perspective. And I, and I, and I trusted him on it because he had an institutional company, an institutional investor, a strategic institutional investor back him. And they were going to be his distribution. And I said, Oh, I see now. And this is how we're going to do this. And this is like, he had, he had it all mapped out. And, but prior to that, he spent three or four years getting no's. He got three or four years getting nobody funding him. Um, he had to iterate, change the model. And he finally got to a point to where now, you know, he's, he's, he's doing a $40 million series B and, you know, he's hitting his stride. And I'm just like, wow, like, okay, I get it now. I see, he said, I, I don't want to fight with any of these, any of these entities. Like I want to make and make their businesses better for, for their customers. And this is how I'm going to do it because they, they don't do this and they're going to need me to do this. And I was like, wow, like that makes sense. So it, I, I think it's all about perspective. I think it's all about how you, how you see the world. And that even as an investor, can that entrepreneur show me a different perspective to be nimble enough and, and, and find these, you know, just hidden opportunities. I think find the hidden opportunities is, is key right now. If you're trying to build the next Zoom for whatever, don't do it. Like it's <laughs> over. Like that that's that ship is sailed. Um, but find something that's unique to you, unique to your culture, unique to people you want to serve, um, and, and 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 go from there. Thank you. Well, I I just want to be able to answer this one question. You can give it a, a yes or a no or um do you think the hospitality industry is going to die? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, there's a lot of money in hospitality, um, so I don't think it will die. I just think it would be really ad adjusted. And I think the overall hospitality industry, is def are, they're definitely licking their wounds, but it really started with Airbnb, if you want to be honest, right? Airbnb was knocking on all these folks doors saying, Hey, let's partner. You should invest. And all of them laughed at them. And now we see Airbnb, uh, you know, it's, it's just taking off again. I hit an opportunity. Nobody believed that, you know, you could go lay on somebody's couch for $50 a night, you know, but you can. And I, you know, when we study Airbnb, you look at what Craigslist, I, I start with Craigslist people were selling rooms in their couches on Craigslist before Airbnb even happened. Mm -hmm. Hidden opportunity. They were convicted. They understood it. And I, you know, I read, I read about, I just took a deeper dive. And what really was the inflection point for them is that they went to, they went, they were in San Francisco and one of their coaches said, Hey, what the hell are you doing in San Francisco? All your customers are in New York. You need to go see them. You need to go fly out to New York. And they're like, why, why should I do this? This is stupid. And you know what? They went out there and they listened to their customers. And one of their customers had a packet like this thick of information on how to improve their business. And they took that information and boom, they took off. Right. Wow. So you never know, you know, again, hitting opportunities, listening to your customers, um, not listening to all the noise and, and what people are tell telling you not to do. Um, but I tell you, those hidden opportunities are, are key for explosive, explosive growth. Great. Well, 
this, I wish I could talk to you for another hour, but we're, we're, we're done with time. Thank you so much for your insights and just answering so honestly and just giving us a little bit of everything. I hope that people participating today enjoyed it and, and gained something out of the conversation. So thank you for coming. I'm gonna pass it on to, to Anya. Sounds good. I want to echo Nadine to thank you, Will, for this awesome, vibrant, and um, and a really uplifting conversation this past hour. Just wanted to say thank you again uh, for joining us, and also everybody who's here and who also stayed a little bit past five. Uh, our next event will be on November nineteenth, so please uh, go to our um, our website to check out our events calendar and register, or just follow us on social media uh, to learn more about what we're up to. Uh, again, thank you everybody for being here. I hope you took um, so many takeaways. I, I sure did. Um, I'm sure that I did. And also it will be helpful for all of our companies here at Ascender. So we'll just said, reach out to him on LinkedIn. So that's the first thing you do after this. That's, that's better than knocking on his door. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so all right. right. Have, Have a good night, everybody. If you're going to knock on my door, wait till after the election. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have Be a good well. Day. Thank you. Thank you.